getting the light off. Good morning. Hey. What a beautiful morning. Could not ask for a better day. So, good morning and welcome to Sunday morning worship with the First Church in Farmington, Connecticut. We're so glad to be here today to be able to be out here on the green and enjoy this temperate weather for um, November. And if you are joining us on Facebook, we extend a special welcome to you. My name is Reverend Susan Gibson. We are the First Church of Christ in Farmington, Connecticut, and we are located at 75 Main Street in Farmington, and we worship every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We hope you'll join us. And we also hope you will be able to join us at some point in person in our meeting house when we are no longer physically distancing. I do want to remind you that if you receive our Friday email from the church office, that email contains the order of worship for today's service. So I invite you to click on that, e on that and you would be able to follow along with the order of worship. If you are here worshiping in person, we ask that you turn off your Wi-Fi. That way our system will not be overloaded and there won't be disruption in our Facebook live stream. If you are a pledging member of this congregation, we would like to encourage you to continue with your pledge during this time of physical distancing. You can do that in one of two ways. You can either um, go to our web page and click on the Give button, which will allow you to give via PayPal. And our web page is firstchurch1652.org. 
The other way you can do, um, give is that you can also go, um, mail a check to our church office at 75 Main Street in Farmington, Connecticut. I do want to point out that the flowers this morning are given in loving memory of Jen, Furnish, Jen Kinney's mother, Sue Furnish, by the Kinney family. So we say thank you to Jen for these beautiful flowers. I do, we do have one quick announcement, and that is from Diane, um, who's going to share a little bit of what we're doing and preparing for Advent. Can you believe? Here we are, 60 degrees. Advent is only three weeks away, folks, and so we're preparing and would like to um, encourage you to prepare. Diane's got a way to help. Here is a representative of the worship committee. And we are doing some Advent. Activity. We are making wooden Advent wreaths. Uh, wreath doesn't have to always be a circle. And we are making the wood. We are putting the holes in. We're sanding them for you. And we have candles that we will give to you as a little kit. You can take them and use natural or not so natural things <laughs> to decorate them. It would be a wonderful idea to do in case we're virtual and we're going to be doing this together. And it's also a wonderful family activity if you would like to do it for one of our shut-ins or someone you know that couldn't possibly do this. On Tuesday, a flyer is going to be sent out so you can get back to me and the worship committee. And we will arrange to cut these and get them to you. But we need to know within the next week because Advent starts at the end of November. So please, if you would like one of these for your home or for someone else, we're happy to make them and have you have fun putting them together and sharing Advent with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. And now as we turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God, let us do with our, so with our nation and our leaders and our hearts and minds. Let us come, in, come seeking God's wisdom for the living of these days in these times. Let us worship God. Call upon God's wisdom, she will answer. Seek God's wisdom, she dwells in the midst of life. Follow God's wisdom. She leads in the paths of light and generosity. Holy God, we hear echoes of your wisdom in Christ Jesus, who dwells in our midst and leads us to abundant life. Keep us alert to the call to follow, ready to respond with justice and joy in your holy moment, which is always now. Amen. to God's word as we hear the words of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. Oh, 
But at midnight there was a shout. Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. exciting to be here in this gorgeous weather. I wanted to tell you a story of a time I felt alone but realized God was with me. As you some, well, some of you know, I was raised in Texas. Has anyone visited Texas before? Raised in Texas. Oh, look, lots of you. It's a huge state, y'all know. We drove seven hours to visit my grandparents, and we were still in Texas. That's how big it was. So we didn't really travel that much outside of the state, and this changed when I went to, went to high school and received a scholarship to go to a music camp for eight weeks called Interlochen. It's in Michigan. And while I had flown a few times before, this was the first time I'd actually flown by myself. When I got there, I didn't know anyone, and I was really lonely and missing my family. There were no cell phones at the time, unlike now where I text or call my parents multiple times a day. I had to walk from my cabin all the way and to wait in line and then talk to them on a payphone, only on Sundays. You can ask your parents to explain what a payphone is. <laughs> anyway, um, I was not the only one who traveled far. There were students from all over the world. My cabin alone had students from Venezuela, Hungary, Iceland, and parts of the U.S. US. All my life, my mom told me that my, mom, my violin playing was a gift from God. I didn't really know what she was talking about at the time, but you know what? She was right. Because I had the ability to play music, I was able to connect with everyone, even though I wasn't able to speak Icelandic, because we all played music. Eventually, I felt less alone. I made all kinds of friends. Sure, they were confused when I said my shirt was striped. <laughs> and uh, when I asked if the grass had stickers, I'm not sure anyone will even know what I'm talking about without one here. <laughs> but we had a good time connecting through music the most. So you should think right now about what God, uh, gifts God has given you that you can use to connect to others. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's art, music, the theater, whatever it is, let it help you know that you are not alone. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for all of our gifts you have given us to connect with others. 
May we use those gifts in a way that shows our gratitude for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. About 30 years ago, while in seminary, in a worship class, a, a, a group of fellow students and I were given the assignment to lead worship in the college chapel. So we got together to plan the worship service and it was to be the Monday after this Sunday. And so one of the women who was there was going to be preaching at her field education site on Sunday on this passage. So we decided she would be the preacher and she would pre and we would use that scripture to plan our worship service. Now, I don't remember what my main responsibility was. What I do remember was, is I was to be the backup preacher. You see, the woman that was to preach may, on a very, very slight chance, had um, something that was impossible to happen that would keep her from being there. But it was a very tiny chance. So we had to have a backup plan, so the backup plan was me. Now, I will admit, as the day fast approached, I could find absolutely no inspiration. And I was working a lot. I was doing two jobs and going to sem seminary full time. So it was a lot. And I did not really have much fuel for this sermon. And I just eventually kind of threw something down that I didn't really know. I could find no good news. I had no conclusion. And I had a prayer, but the prayer was, please, God, don't let me have to preach. <laughs> so the day came, as it always does, and the classmate who was supposed to preach, who had, had a wonderful sermon, she was trimmed and ready. 
but at the last minute that thing happened and she was not able to be there. She was all prepared and very wise. And the foolish, very unprepared Susan was to preach. So how is that for irony? I'm to preach a parable, a sermon on a parable about preparedness, and I am not prepared. I'm to be the prepared and preach and appear wise, but I'm revealed a fool. You see, on the surface though, the parable of the ten bridesmaids is a cautionary tale about preparedness. It says, come well stocked, prepared for any possibility. Don't be a foolish bridesmaid, be a wise bridesmaid. My story is a lesson on what not to do. So, the service is over. You can go home now. But the thing is, is, is that works well and makes sense if we think of this parable in isolation. However, we never really read this story in isolation. We can't because you have to consider these words that came before. Take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Why did they need extra oil for the journey, you may ask? What about these words from the Sermon on the Mount? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And consider these words from Paul. Each one of, of, a, of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. Better yet, be a fool for Christ. And finally, that one passage that we all had to memorize at some point in our lives probably, and that is, for God so loved the world that he gave. You see, one of the things that Jesus does is to take us out of our black and white world and throws us into paradox. In one breath, Jesus says, don't toss your pearls before swine. And in the next, he says, give to the one who asks you. He says, the first shall be last. And then in another paragraph, he'll say, the last shall be, I mean, the first will be first. And then there is the never ending theological argument about whether we are saved by works or faith. So I ask you, are we to be foolish? Or wise. The parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaid seems to reveal a God counter to what we know about God and Jesus. In this parable, the wise ones are prepared for any contingency. They do not share with their neighbor. It would be foolish to give some of their oil away. The foolish ones carry nothing and deserve to be left out. In this world, God is an imminently fair being, raining blessings on the good and curses on the foolish. If only that were really true. Uh, maybe not. Yet what I know is counter to that very fair view. Consider what happened to me on that Monday afternoon in worship. Although my classmate could not be there, she sent me her sermon and said, please preach this. She wanted to share her oil. She wanted to share the light that was in her. She wanted to share her light with me, even though she could not be here. My other classmates were gracious and supportive, and I was overwhelmed with grace. Now I ask, I want to ask you, if you consider the witness of Jesus and his life and his death and resurrection, is there any bigger fool than God? who so loves the world that God gives, love, grace, forgiveness, over and over again, an endless source? All of us at some point will find ourselves counted among the foolish. We've all had times when we've run out of fuel, literally and figuratively. We've all had times when the best that we could do is show up. And we've had times when we just didn't prepare, decided that the work or time or whatever we needed wasn't worth it. 
when we've been caught unaware. We've had times when we've prepared and it's still not enough. And we've had times when we have not prepared and we've passed with flying colors. This is not an either or situation. God is merciful and gracious and forgiving whether we are prepared or not. And a deep relationship with God is forged in ongoing preparation through prayer and service and worship. This, these disciplines help us to be alert for signs of grace, for opportunities to give and care, as Micah says, to love kindness and do justice and walk humbly. You know, lately we've been doing a lot of time, spending a lot of time in our country defining who is foolish and who is wise in our world. I'm wondering if the biggest fools are those who draw lines between the wise and the foolish. Consider our bridesmaids. Both the wise and foolish drew clear lines. The wise had oil, so they got to go to wedding. The foolish ran out of oil, so they did not go to wedding. And even in some ways, the foolish agreed. One commentator I read pondered, why didn't the foolish bridesmaids stay instead of going and looking for oil? A truly wise person would know that God welcomes us prepared or not, with full tanks or empty tanks. And a truly wise God welcomes all of us whether we are wise or foolish. Maybe the wisdom of God is that while we are busy making lines to divide into camps, God is drawing a circle to draw us in. All of us are needed at the wedding, prepared or not. And it is not our job to decide who is judge as judge and jury. That is the God, job of God. I have to be honest. I'm still struggling with why the bride, bridegroom did what he did. The bridegroom is a kind, kind of a fool by God's standards, if you ask me. You know, if you consider this, this parable is at the very end of Jesus' life, is when he tells this here on earth. In just a few short verses, Jesus will conclude all his sayings. And say, then he will say to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. And still knowing this, Jesus went forward, a fool, some would say, to the cross for us, for all people. So most certainly be wise and prepared. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God, and be a fool for Christ. Share your oil. Let in those who are on the outside, or let those on the inside out, even if it means including your unprepared and foolish self. Because remember this, for having loved his own who were on the world, he loved them to the end. Foolish, most would say. And yet that is the wisdom of God, isn't it? Let us pray. God, your wisdom appears foolish, but may we be fools for you. Amen.
And now as we come to this time of prayer, we may, may wonder if our prayers are foolish, if our actions are wise. Yet the foolishness of God is that God welcomes our prayers, be they foolish or wise, elegant or simple, silent or full of words. Let us pray to be alert and ready to welcome God, to welcome the one who said, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. In this time of prayer, we do have some specific prayer concerns. I'd like to lift up all the families affected by the ESPN layoffs this week. Also, we continue to we pray for Suzette, who has recently been diagnosed with cancer. We pray for Nancy Barron, who is suffering with back pain. And we pray for Scott Willett's grandmother, who broke her femur. And we also pray for those who have died from COVID-19. All over the world, the numbers at this point are over 1,230,753 people have died worldwide, over 234,000 in the United States, and 4,645 in Connecticut alone. We pray for those folks and their families, and prayers for all those living with and being treated for COVID especially Lima, a friend of the Lapita. Also, I think it's a good time for us to pray for our nation and citizens, that we may not only seek the common good, but also the wisdom to recognize what is truly the common good. And may we be guided by God's ethic of love and care for the least of these. Let us pray. Eternal God, we wait for you. Sometimes we tire and lose steam, run out of gas, yet you are still there, opening the door and welcoming us. We pray for the church that we are ever ready with our lamps trimmed and burning bright. May we be prepared with open hearts, ready to listen, ready for peace and justice. We pray for the nations of the world, heal our divisions, that we may discover our common humanity and seek our common good. We pray especially for our nation as we journey in this divisive time. May we prepare our hearts for trust, for love, for respect. May we be fueled not by righteous indignation and rage, but instead by a deep desire for solidarity, for community. We pray especially today for those affected by COVID and those who care for those affected by COVID. God, our fuel is running low. We're experiencing pandemic fatigue. Fill us up, oh God. Fill us up so that we can care for the vulnerable and discover joy and hope in seeking the common good. Lord, we pray for our families and friends and neighbors and all those who are alone and those we name before you today. Andrew Sturgis, struggling with depression and substance abuse. Nancy Barron with her back pain. Scott Millette's grandmother, Leroy and Suzette, and all those families from ESPN who are affected by the layoffs. Lord, in your love, hear all our prayers, both those spoken and those we say now silently in our hearts. Pray this now in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue with worship, I would like to thank, uh, do my time with a special thank you, and that is to the worship committee. Would the members here from the worship committee please stand up? Because...
you know, they were willing to turn on a dime and have indoor, have, have, um, have this outdoor worship, and I thank them. They are ever ready, prepared, and alert, and also wise in the ways of God. So thank you. Readiness for mission is one way to interpret the diligence of the wise wedding attendants. Their lamps are filled and available to be sparked into light at the moment the beloved appears to begin the wedding feast of justice, love, and peace. Let us be ready, too, with our tithes and offerings to support the work of our congregation and the wider church. Your congregation makes so many ministries possible, things like family promise, neighbors in need, the Farmington Food Pantry. And I invite you to continue with your pledge during this time. So let us now take a moment to silently reflect on the ways that we are ready to minister with the common good. Let us pray. God, we have come and given generously of our gifts. Take and bless and multiply them so that they may be a blessing in your world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. God's ways may seem foolish to the world, yet God's ways are deeply wise. So keep your lamps trimmed and filled and your hearts open, ready to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. For we are all invited and we are all needed. God has drawn a circle that includes all. Go in peace, counting on the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen.